right back to the beginning. I particularly remember a uh, summer when I was visiting the UK. I think it was 93, 92, 93, 94. And there were two clusters of ideas that were, were crashing around and sparking off each other. One was this idea of foresight, and the other was the idea of wisdom. And there was just a tremendous sparky uh, relationship between the two that had a lot of energy and it really captured my attention. And the result was that I wrote this book called The Foresight Principle, Cultural Recovery in the 21st Century. Uh, notice the optimism in the, or the inherent optimism in the subtitle, because I actually really think we can handle all this. We just have to pay attention. So this was, if you like, a, a foray, a first foray for me uh, into the area of foresight. And the idea of it being a principle, an idea, something that could be put into practice perhaps, but at the beginning was just an idea. So this, this uh, presentation is actually about taking that, as Joe said, uh, into implementation. Do <clears throat> you think it would be a good idea to shut the door, keep the noise out? Yeah, thanks. One of the powerful selling points, foresight in general, is that it's not new. It's been around for millennia. You can actually look at the work of early peoples and see notions of purpose and design and foresight in a lot of the things they did. I'll leave you to maybe tease out some examples. There are many of them. Tracking forward to uh, our own time, I became aware years ago that there were these traditional phrases which represented collective social learnings at a very accessible level. There's nothing intellectual about this, nothing hard. Look before you leap, obvious. Forewarned is forearmed, and the one I like best is a stitch in time saves nine. Now, I suggest that we already all know this. This is not new. This is not controversial. These terms exist because they emerged out of social experience over a very long time. So in a sense, all we're doing is putting the icing on this, this ancient cake that's been around for ages and has really taken a new form. Mind you, an ancient cake might not be a very good thing to have. The notion of a stitch in time saves nine does give you a hint of the payoff of good foresight work. It means that if you act in a timely and appropriate way, then chances are you'll save the clearing up the mess that would have occurred otherwise. And we see that embedded around us all the time. When things go wrong, you often hear people saying, that showed a clear lack of foresight. So that's like when it comes too late. So it's desirable to have foresight up front, to use it, and as we described yesterday, it's actually part of the functioning of the human brain-mind system. We, we operate that way. All we're doing is taking that inbuilt capacity, developing it, growing it, extending it, making it more powerful and applying it. So it's really helpful when you're explaining to people, and I know many of you are already saying, how the hell am I going to explain this to my husband, my wife, my partner, my friends? Well, maybe go back to something simple like this that's based in common experience and just say, well, it's about this. I, I can't explain it in detail yet, but it's something to do. Look before you leap. Forewarned is forearmed. The stitch in time saves nine. In, uh, in the mid-90s, I tried to look at how foresight uh, expands awareness and understanding. Another way to look at this is to think of it as a growth of consciousness, a growth of capacity. And here are some of the ways, I'm not going to read through all this, that uh, I think foresight work does do that. It's about scanning the future, it's about clarifying issues, it's about acting in a timely and appropriate way. I wouldn't want you to think, however, that I think that foresight is a panacea. It is not. There is an inescapable dialectic, it seems to me, after reflecting on this for some time, between foresight on the one hand and experience on the other. You cannot separate them because most people don't really consciously see the need for foresight until there's some experience of what happens if you don't have it. It's good to look at case studies of that kind. One you might look at, for example, would be the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the UK a couple of years ago and the way that devastated so many farms in northern England. That was based on bad practice. It was known to be a, a danger. People ignored the danger then the whole industry had the experience of what, what happens if you 
uh, don't get it right. <clears throat> I thought this was a very powerful statement, very brief. It came from the second Limits to Growth book. Many of you may remember the first one, published in about 71, 72, called, just called Limits to Growth. Caused an uproar. Uh, people, some people liked it, some people didn't, some people argued with the computer modeling and argued that it was neo-Malthusian. It was basically arguing that uh, it, the, the Malthusian line that, um, that population would outstrip resources. This was their second look at the, at the topic in the early 90s, 20 years later. And uh, I found this a very interesting book because they had obviously responded to a lot of the criticism they'd had, the critique. And remember, critique is a vital part of Futures work. It helps keep us, keeps us honest, and it also helps to increase the quality of what we do. So they absorbed that critique, produced a second book. And I just think this, this statement is almost incontrovertible. It's a very powerful statement, which is backed up, again, by everyday experience. You all know the, the, the uh, saying about you can't turn a super tanker on a, on a dime. Well, of course you can't, because you know that these systems have inherent momentum. It takes time to, to deal with them. It takes time to change the dynamics of the system. So this really is a rationale underlying the emergence of foresight as a social capacity. It suggests, for example, that governments at every level need to be investing in getting this right. So here are a few of the contexts. It's a bit difficult to, to get a clear set of institutions of foresight or foresight context because it's quite hard to define them precisely. Some do a bit of foresight, some are centrally about foresight or futures, some are about strategy, some are in-house, some are government, huge variety. So here are, here are some that all have uh, case studies. GBN has almost disappeared into a, a big consulting firm that, uh, that bought it out. The Finland Futures Academy is uh, based at Turku School of Economics in Finland. That's a, an academic enterprise. WFS and WFSF are the two sort of global organizations. Durham Small Business Foresight is gone because the person who ran it is now working at another university. But he's actually laying on courses on foresight and strategy. So it's disappeared from that context, reappeared in another. The UK... The UK uh, DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, has a future unit and that coordinated the, uh, the UK Futures uh, program, Foresight program, which uh, one of our students, Andrew Weinberg, has uh, written about last year and we're just about to publish his monograph with three others looking at national foresight projects and this is also written in there. So you can get an overview of that from that. I would suggest that you do look up on the web the Long Now Foundation. It's based in the States. It's one of the most interesting and innovative projects or social innovations that I have ever seen. Because its uh, agenda is really to try to get people to rethink how they relate to time. And without wanting to confuse you too much, Feeding into futures inquiry, foresight work, from below, as it were, are streams of deep work about philosophy, about macro history, about society, and about time. Time is almost papered over and hidden as a social issue, yet time is just as important as space in structuring the social order. So here's some people who've really taken up a bit of that time issue and try to get people to think outside of the everyday, here and now, short-term thinking context that are so common these days. Have a look at what they're doing. They're creating a clock, but it's a very long-term clock. They're setting up a library, but it's a very long-term library. They're actually dealing with something fundamental. So that gives you a sense of the diversity. And uh, obviously, these things cost money. So are they going to be business entities? producing a product that's strategic advice maybe to an organization or maybe are they better thought of as part of the social infrastructure that a vulnerable high-tech society really requires for its safe functioning? Probably both. 
So it's important to get one's head around, okay, so what's the payoff? What do these things deliver for the time, money, and effort that goes into them? And here are some that I pulled out. They're written about in more detail in, in uh, Futures for the Third Millennium. Take from this the idea that they are useful in a series of practical ways. I also want to go back a little bit because I, I constantly want to stress that this is not something that we're sitting in Melbourne, Australia, thinking about on our own. What we're doing here is linked to a whole series of processes, a whole series of innovations, and the work of many people around the world for some years. Look at the date on this. It's 1988. There's a lot of good work done in the US at the state level and the local level. A lot of state foresight projects that were carried out over a number of years. And that's written up in books like Foresight and National Decisions. That material is there for us to look at. Here's a bit, uh, a, a later piece from about a decade ago. And it contrasts traditional strategy work with foresight work. Short term to long term, reactive to anticipatory, a bit simple, dualistic, okay, but trying to get their heads around what, uh, what this is all about back then. So there are places you can go. There are sources of information. There are case studies which quite clearly describe how people have gone about this work and what the results have been.